Hello, this lesson is for my college biology students to review the diversity of life. All the diversity of life on Earth, we are currently grouping in three domains. The bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. We're going to start with viruses, which technically are not alive, but because they interact with living things so much, I'm going to have a short review of viruses. Viruses can be classified by their structure. They're composed of nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, inside of a protein coat called a capsid. Some of them are surrounded by a phospholipid membrane, which is taken from the cell from which the virus emerged. And then there's surface proteins that the viruses use for binding to host cells. So this is a diagram of what a virus would look like. The origins of viruses, nobody really knows. Uh, they, maybe they were genetic elements that were capable of copying and spreading to new parts of the genomes and somehow became capable of spreading between cells. Some people hypothesize that they were remnant genes left over from previously parasitic organisms or, or perhaps more than one possible origin. We don't really know at this point. And this diagram just shows the variety of viruses. It also shows the bacteria, eukarya, and archaea, and just a sheer number of different types of viruses because think about it, every type of organism can be host to multiple kinds of viruses so, so the sheer numbers of types of viruses is staggering. Viruses really are not living and they don't evolve from one virus to another in the same way as living things do so the phylogeny of viruses is very different. Instead we tend to classify them based on their their structure maybe or their host. So animal and plant viruses often have a phospholipid envelope which they derive when they emerge from the host cell that they came from. Uh, sometimes we'll refer to viruses as bacteriophages if they infect bacteria cells. Another way to classify them is by their genetic material. Here's some examples. Single-strand RNA viruses include some of the most well-known viruses, of course, COVID-19, uh, one of the coronaviruses that uh, has plagued the world. Influenza, rabies, measles, Ebola, some of the, the most deadly viruses. And RNA double-stranded viruses, HIV that causes AIDS, is an example of a retrovirus. And they use a different type of enzyme system for copying the RNA into DNA. It uses an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And it's it's extremely error prone, makes lots of errors when it builds the DNA. And that's one reason why HIV evolves so rapidly. The other RNA viruses use a different enzyme to build more virus RNA when they enter into a cell. And then there's DNA single strand and double strand viruses as well, and some of the examples of those. Now, into the living things, bacteria, our first domain. Bacteria are prokaryote cells, meaning they have no nucleus or other complex organelles. They divide by binary fission, essentially growing larger, copying a single chromosome and then splitting in half. Their cell walls contain peptidoglycan. They do have circular chromosomes, a single circular chromosome. They don't have introns in their DNA, and their transcription and translation are quite different than eukaryotic transcription and translation. They occur in every environment possible. Their ecology and metabolism it varies widely. Some of them are obligate aerobes, which means they require oxygen. Others are obligate anaerobes, meaning they cannot handle any oxygen. It poisons them and they die. Others are facultative anaerobes, meaning they can take oxygen or they can get along fine without it. A lot of the bacteria are decomposers, one of their main ecological roles. They recycle chemicals and nutrients. Others are photosynthetic, some are chemosynthetic, others are nitrogen-fixing bacteria, very critical for us because most of the nitrogen that we use to build our proteins and nucleic acids and other chemicals come from the nitrogen that was fixed by nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Some bacteria are pathogenic, meaning they cause disease. Now, even though that's relatively few species of bacteria, they do cause some very serious diseases. Now, bacteria are difficult to classify. Their phylogeny is very controversial since bacteria only reproduce asexually, and they have lots of horizontal gene transfer, which means that bacteria can transfer DNA from one bacteria to another, even between bacteria that are not closely related to each other genetically. So we get genetic similarities that may or may not result from descent with modification, as we normally think of how evolution occurs. Also, a few taxa have been cultured in labs. Some of them are very difficult to grow. We just don't have the right 
kinds of nutrients for them to live on. So estimates are that less than 2% of all bacteria species have ever been grown in laboratories. Most bacteria now are identified by metagenomics, which means sequencing DNA from environmental samples. So we don't actually grow the bacteria themselves. We just sample the DNA in an area and identify different species of bacteria from those DNA samples. Diversity and phylogeny are constantly changing. We're learning more all the time. It is better known than archaea, but it continues to change. Often classification of bacteria are done for medically important bacteria or ecological importance and not necessarily phylogeny. So here's a, a sample phylogenetic tree of bacteria. There's lots of different versions of phylogenies of bacteria. If we classify them morphologically or based on cell structure, coccus means sphere, and so commonly common bacteria streptococcus, a species of streptococcus causes strep throat. Staphylococcus, some are normally found on our skin as part of our normal flora, but certain species can cause uh, disease. Staph means cluster. Bacillus is a rod shape, and so, you know, strep also means chain, so streptobacillus. And spirillum is another common shape. Vibrio, uh, kind of a curved rod. Uh, some bacteria have flagella multiple flagella or you know a few at one end. Some bacteria form what are called endospores, essentially dehydrating their cells and, and reserving all the important nutrients to one end and forming a very thick spore around that end so they can survive extremely harsh conditions, drying out, heat or cold. Then sometimes they're classified medically. A particular stain that's used in medicine all the time to identify what kind of bacteria doctors are dealing with is called a gram stain, and you don't have to know anything about it, but just realize different bacteria, because of their structures, stain different colors. And so rather than being based on how they've actually are genetically related to each other, it's just how they're structurally related. Sometimes we classify them based on metabolism. Are they phototrophic? or chemotrophic? Do they uh, break down organic compounds or not? Metabolic classification is sometimes done. And again, you don't need to know any of these particulars. Just know that classification is sometimes done based on metabolism. Now, the ecological importance of bacteria is enormous. Probably the single most important thing is their, their role as decomposers. Without them, chemicals wouldn't be recycled that we need. So we depend heavily on them. All life on Earth depends on that role of decomposers. We mentioned already pathogens. A lot of bacteria also are important as food. Not only food for humans, but food for other organisms as well. And I just gave a sample, you know, yogurt, cheese, vinegar, alcohols, uh, as some of the foods that are important to people. Also for medicines, for example, a lot of antibiotics are produced by bacteria. And their role in scientific research has been enormous. Now let's move to the archaea. Archaea are single-celled organisms also, but they have very different genetic and molecular characteristics than either bacteria or eukaryotes. Originally they were thought to be bacteria until in the 1970s when gene sequencing started being available and, and some people started realizing that they're as different genetically from bacteria as they are from eukaryotes. People had assumed they were bacteria because they're also prokaryotic, they don't have a nucleus. But when the genetic sequences became available, they realized what we're dealing with are really two different groups. They have very unique cell membrane lipids. They don't have peptidoglycan in their cell walls like regular bacteria do. They do have circular chromosomes like bacteria, but they have introns, and their transcription and translation are much more similar to eukaryotes. They often, many of them have unique metabolic pathways. Uh, one example would be methanogenesis. They produce methane gas as a byproduct of their metabolism. A lot of them live in very extreme environments, uh, hot springs, acid pools, salt lakes, and volcanic vents, areas where no other living things survive well. And again, like the bacteria, their classification is very controversial. Uh, they only reproduce asexually, so we don't get descent as we're used to. They exhibit lots of horizontal gene transfer as well, so their genetic similarities don't necessarily result from descent with modification like we normally think of for evolution, but they swap pieces of DNA with other species in their environment. Again, very few taxa have been cultured in labs, even fewer than for the regular bacteria. Like the regular bacteria, most have been identified by metagenomics or sequencing the DNA from environmental samples. 
there are more being discovered all the time, and over time, I'm sure that we'll gain a clearer picture of how they're related, but for now, their diversity and their phylogeny are, are fairly obscure. Here's a few examples of the archaea. The thermophiles, thermal means heat, fill is loving, so they love the heat, they thrive in hot pools with temperatures as high as 122 degrees Celsius. Halophiles live in, in very high salt concentrations that other things just can't handle osmotically. It would dehydrate them, but 10 to 20 percent salt is, is normal for these. Acidophiles thrive best in, in very acidic environments. Alkalophiles in very basic or alkaline environments. And there are some that are radiation tolerant. Some can withstand up to 30,000 grays of gamma radiation. And just to give you a comparison, five grays of radiation would be lethal to humans. So extreme environments for some of these archaea. But they are of, of great ecological importance. None of them that have been discovered to date are pathogenic. Also, the methanogens we mentioned before, here's the formula for how they take carbon dioxide, combine it with hydrogen gas, and produce methane and water. These are found in wetlands or, or marshes. It's what gives that swamp gas smell to things. Also inside animal intestines. That's why cows and lots of other animals produce methane gas. These are used in wastewater treatment plants to generate methane from, from wastewater. And some also fix ammonia into nitrogen compounds as part of the nitrogen cycle. So they're important for those reasons as well.